Hi, thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Today we'll be focusing on conflicting principles as part of our Message to a Messed Up Church series, and the scriptures we'll be looking at are found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. You can find the Life Notes on our website by visiting calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here is Pastor Chad Garrison. I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians 5 is our text. We're continuing our, our uh, series, Message to a Messed Up Church. And uh, if you don't have a Bible with you and you're here in the Sweetwater campus, uh, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1134. If you're joining us from the Parker campus and you don't have a Bible with you, there's a table with Bibles on it right in the back of the room. Just get up right now, go grab a Bible, turn to page 1134. You'll be able to follow along with us and uh, know what 1 Corinthians 5 says. And as always, at any of our campuses or if you're joining us online, uh, if you don't have a Bible and you want one, we want to get you a Bible. So if you're one of our online viewers, then uh, just message us. We'll get you a Bible. We'll mail one to you, uh, deliver one to you. If you're in one of our campuses, uh, just take one of those Bibles with you. It is our gift to you because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Uh, Hey, I just got to apologize for my voice. It sounds a little bit fuzzy to me. Maybe it sounds normal to you. Uh, but uh, I, was, uh, I woke up Monday morning, was sick, and uh, felt horrible for a couple of days and been recovering since. I feel perfectly fine now, but my voice apparently decided to rebel. So uh, I told somebody, I said, I, I just sound like I'm talking to a cheese grater. Doesn't hurt, does anything wrong. Maybe it's just going to be this way from now on. So I don't know. But uh, anyway... So if you're like sitting there thinking, I need to take him water or a cough drop, don't worry about it. It's, it's good. Hey, do you like tension in your life? <laughs> that, that was pretty clear, wasn't it? But see, here's the thing. It's present in almost every single situation of life. There, there's tension. Uh, okay, we just celebrated our nation's Independence Day, right? Um, I was sick on the 4th, yay. Uh, but... Uh, Here's the thing, I unapologetically love the United States of America, but I am not happy about many of our uh, government policies or cultural abominations. Okay, that's a tension I live with. Uh, As a nation, we live in the tension between freedom and security, right? And and that's something that we balance, uh, go back and forth between. Uh, As parents, we love our children, right? Okay, okay, just making sure. (laughs) But we have to discipline our kids. Uh, Well, at least you should discipline your kids. If you love them, you should discipline them. But, But here's the thing. When you're disciplining your kids, it hurts you. And so you really don't want to do it, but you need to do it. You remember that old phrase you used to hear when you were a kid, this hurts me more than it hurts you? And you're thinking, mom and dad are liars. Until you become a parent and you're like, oh, I get it now. You're conflicted. As parents, we live in the tension of protecting our children because there's a lot of stuff out there that's going to hurt them, but also trying to give them the freedom to grow up and make mistakes that you can help them manage and learn from and gain responsibility from. Uh, So we just live with tension all the time. Uh, So welcome to a message on tension, on conflicting principles that challenge us as we live our lives trying to follow Jesus. Uh, So if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, was uh, raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus, this is, we're going to talk about a tension that you live in every single day as a Christ follower. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, listen in. Because we want you to become a follower of Jesus. We want you to understand what we uh, believe and how we navigate that. So we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to read the whole passage. It's just 13 verses. But I I do have to set it up because right before this, at the end of chapter 4, the Apostle Paul rebukes the Corinthian church for being arrogant. 
And he talks about the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. And I'm going to come visit you. Do you want me to come and, and be the mean parent, the disciplined parent? Do you want me to come and, and be the kind, loving parent? You guys decide. And he's, he's basically ending chapter 4 as an entry into chapter 5. When Paul wrote this, it was just a letter. There were no chapters. So that you know that. So chapter 5, verse 1 begins. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and, a, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife. That's messed up. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present, and the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Can I just pause there and say, we have no idea what he meant by that. But I'm pretty sure it wasn't fleshed out in the Spanish Inquisition very well. But it does sound like they, you could justify burning somebody at the stake, doesn't it? Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you, are, are, you really are unleavened for Christ. Our Passover land has, lamb has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, calls himself a Christian, if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside, but purge the evil person from among you. Uh, man, that's a rough passage, isn't it? Uh, when we started this series, I thought, I know what chapter 5 is all about. Uh, and uh, wasn't excited about, about them. But now you see why Paul rebuked them for their arrogance. This is truth. This is harsh. This creates tension. And, and, and some of you are extremely uneasy reading this passage. Because some of you are like going, hey, aren't we supposed to forgive and accept and not judge? And he sure talked a lot about judging people and throwing them out. And some of you are really excited about this passage because you're like, hey, yeah, let's have a bonfire and burn some heretics. <laughs> let's do it. I'm with Paul here. Come on, you get the wood, you get the fuel, I'll get the hot dogs. We'll have a great time. <laughs> so understand there is a tension between grace and truth. There is a tension that is always going to exist between grace and truth. And this passage is a great place to, to just kind of let that tension rest on us because whether you're a let's burn them at the stake person or let's just forgive them and, and hug them person, uh, it, it all meets in this passage. Because we are a people of grace, unapologetically. We know that we are saved by grace and grace alone. It, it was God sending Jesus into this world to be the Messiah, to be the Savior, to suffer and die on the cross to pay for my sins and your sins, that, and his death and resurrection, we have forgiveness, we have hope, we have life. Amen. Okay, that's it. Not because you're good, not because you've done anything, but simply because God provided salvation and gave us a gift. Praise God for grace. Everyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. Amen. Okay, so we're unapologetic about grace. In fact, here at Calvary, one of our core values is uncomfortable grace, right? Because the tension makes this uncomfortable. We believe that followers of Jesus give the same limitless grace they have received from God. 
So we believe that, hey, as a child of God, as somebody who follows Jesus, we know that our sins have all been forgiven. We know that we're not deserving of that forgiveness. Okay, that's a big, big piece of it. If you think you're deserving of it, you need to go back to the whole idea of a gift because you don't deserve a gift. You, you don't earn a gift. You were given a gift. It's undeserved. So we, we, we understand that we've been forgiven of all of our sins, even though we didn't do anything to deserve that. And so since we're enjoying this limitless grace of God, we want to pass that on to others, to each other here in the walls and to the people who are outside the walls because we want them to know this grace of God. So we're all about grace, and we are all about truth. We're all about grace, and we're all about truth, because we are people of the Bible. If you come to our intro class, we're going to explain to you our five essential doctrines. And our first essential doctrine is we believe the Bible is the inerrant and inspired Word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. We, we, hey, everything we teach is based on the Word of God. And then, of course, our very first core value, relatable truth, is if we read and apply God's word, God will change our lives. That's why we preach scripture. That's why we give them away. That's because we want you to read them. Uh, so, you know, we're people of grace and we're people of truth. And there's a tension there. There's always going to be a tension there. Now, again, some of us are like, well, you know, Jesus said in Matthew 7, judge not that you will not be judged. And he went on to talk about take the, the you know, big log out of your own eye before you try to take the splinter out of your brother's eye and, and all that. We, so we don't, we don't want to judge. Of course, a few verses later in chapter 7 of Matthew, he said, you will recognize false prophets by their fruit because a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit and a diseased tree cannot bear good fruit. Huh. Same chapter. See, Jesus was comfortable with the tension. There is an ever-present tension between the truth of God and the grace of God. Let me just say that again. There's always a tension between the truth of God and the grace of God, and both are essential to represent Jesus. Both are essential to represent Jesus. Look, we believe you can't represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. His character is grace and truth. That's what the Apostle John wrote in John chapter 1, verse 14, he said, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, the eternal God, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the one and only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was full of grace and he was full of truth. Even though there's a tension, they coexist. So Jesus was and is full of grace, mercy, and forgiveness. After all, he's the one who said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. Whoever believes in him. Whoever believes in him. Full of grace. Of course, Jesus is and was completely and totally true. Because in John 14, Jesus said, I am the way. You know the next part? I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Sometimes Jesus spoke with <laughs> extreme words of grace, and sometimes he spoke with extreme words of truth, and people didn't like it. Actually, they didn't like either one. So here's the thing. We cannot compromise truth if we want to represent Jesus to a deceived and dying world. They say that again. We cannot compromise the truth if we're going to represent Jesus to a world that is deceived by sin and is dying in their sin. And at the same time, we must be people of uncomfortable grace, proclaiming the mercy of God to people who are trapped in their sin and self-destruction. Um, Jesus calls us to represent both. And it will be awkward at times. It will be uncomfortable often. And we will feel the tension as we follow Jesus. Because that's the tension you feel when you read 1 Corinthians 5. There's a problem in the church. Paul says, hey, we're people of grace. We're people of truth. Here's what I want you to do. And so let's talk about how do we live out grace and truth? 
How do you live out grace and truth? So um, just so you understand the challenge of this, as I was writing this message, I, I really wanted to call this message, everyone is welcome at Calvary. Now get out, you filthy sinner. <laughs> okay? Because isn't that what, what we're reading about? Right? You read, I read 1 Corinthians 5, and I'm like, come on in. Now get out. <laughs> we love you. You're a sinner. Uh, I mean, so it's, uh, it's just that, that tension. So uh, I just thought it would be really helpful, uh, at least it was for me as I wrote this, but it may be helpful for you too, to share with you how we're trying to live out grace and truth at Calvary on a, on a leadership level. And hopefully you can take the principles that we adopt and apply to your life and help you accomplish grace and truth where you're living in your family, in your home, among your friends, at your work, uh, all the places you go, so that you can better represent Jesus. So here at Calvary, the first thing we do is we focus on the mission, leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. We want to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Okay? That, that's our mission. And in case you're wondering, the mission tries to capture the whole grace and truth part of it. Uh, Jesus embodies grace and truth, and Jesus is the one who can change lives. Okay, that's why it's about a life-changing relationship with Jesus. It's not about being a member of the church. It's not about, uh, you know, joining something. It is about encountering the Son of God and Savior of the world who will change your life because we know only Jesus can save people from hell. Only Jesus can forgive people of their sins and take them to heaven. Nothing else, no one else, there is no other way. I don't know, did I mention John 14? Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You can't get to the Father except through me. So, here at Calvary, we want to lead people to Jesus. Now, we picked that word lead on purpose because we don't want to push people. I, I, look, I can be pushy trying to get people to, you know, believe in Jesus, but we really don't want to push people. We don't want to badger people. We're not going to yell at people. We're not going to browbeat or guilt people to try to get them to follow Jesus. We don't want to do this in an angry way because there's no grace in that. We want to lead. We want to invite. We want to encourage people with gentleness. Hey, meet Jesus. He will change your life. I'm not trying to get you to join a cult or, you know, be a, a you know, volunteer at the church. All the time. I just want you to meet Jesus. And, and the, the way we approach this, it's kind of summed up with this idea. And this is a three words that you may want to try in your relationships because I think it'll really help. Relationship precedes rebuke. Relationship precedes rebuke. In other words, we want to love people and serve people before we try to tell them they're not living their life the right way. Do you realize that the gospel in and of itself is a rebuke to every single person who listens to it? Okay, now if you're a follower of Jesus, you already get that, but you also understand that when you open God's word and you read God's word and apply God's word, guess what it challenges you to do? To change, right? I don't know about you guys, but when I read the Bible, I have to kind of repent and go, oh yeah, I gotta stop doing that. Oh, I need to start doing that. I need to do that better. Am I the only one? No. Yeah, okay, you guys get that? Okay, good. Let's make sure, because otherwise we've got another sermon to preach. So anyway, so, you know, the truth is a rebuke to our lives. And so when we share the gospel with someone, basically what you're telling them is, hey, you're doing it wrong, life, and if you want to do it right, you need to follow Jesus. That, that's, a, that's a hard message. That's why Jesus said that the gospel is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. The gospel is offensive and people trip over it because the gift of grace is too easy, but part of it is just because Jesus is saying, you don't know how to live your life, let me tell you. So let's love people, let's serve people, let's show the grace of God to people before telling them the truth, offering them the rebuke. Okay, that, that's what we're trying to do. And that's why we serve our community, not just because we want to be nice, but because we want to be able to tell people the truth, and that's our way of getting, earning the right to be heard. That's why we emphasize character. Can't represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. Well, we all know that Jesus said you're supposed to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. 
Okay, so we're supposed to love. And every church I was in taught you're supposed to love people. They said they loved people. Problem is, none of the people they were talking about loving knew it. None of them felt loved by the church. So when we go out these doors and people know that we're Christians, they know that we go, go to Calvary, they know that we follow Jesus, then uh, we want to treat them with kindness and respect, right? Because the Apostle Paul said, we'll talk about this in a few weeks, love is patient and love is kind. And so if we're not patient and we're not kind, are we loving? No. So we're not representing Jesus in that, in that moment. So we need to repent, not just get madder at the people who aren't doing what we want them to do. So uh, we want to live that way so that people feel loved by us because we're trying to convince unchurched people to listen to the truth and follow Jesus. Okay, grace and truth. In a sense, we're leading with grace, but we're going to tell the truth. And, and, and here's what we know. We, we know that if you surrender to Jesus... Jesus will change your life. We know that if you surrender to Jesus, Jesus will change your life because, and this is important, it's impossible to follow Jesus and stay the same. It's impossible to follow Jesus and stay the same. Um, <laughs> to me, that makes so much sense because Jesus said, follow me, right? And we're followers of Jesus. And, and so if you say I'm a follower of Jesus, but you're staying right where you are. Are you following Jesus? <laughs> yeah. He's not a liar, but we might be. So if your life doesn't change, have you experienced a life-changing relationship with Jesus? See, I mean, and yeah, there's not, there's not like a time limit or anything on that, but, but you and I know, hey, has God really changed my life? That's why we use that whole qualification of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, a life-changing relationship with Jesus. That, that's what it's all about. So part of the Corinth problem was they were so enthralled with grace, they didn't apply truth. We're people of grace. So, of course, if we've got a guy who has committed this horrible sin of immorality and that he's sleeping with his mom, we're just going to be okay with that because we're people of grace. I mean, we're all sinners, right? And so we're not going to judge anyone because Jesus said, don't judge or, or you'll be judged. Ever been around people who are that way? They can approve anything? See, here's the, here's the problem with that. If you don't apply truth uh, and, and you're so enthralled with grace, then it results in churches that reject biblical authority and affirm unbiblical lifestyle choices. See, that, that's what happens. When, you, when you're enamored with grace and you let go of truth, then you stop affirming uh, Scripture and you start affirming things that Scripture condemns. That, that's, that's the danger. Now, on the flip side, if you're a church that's all truth and no grace, you're just a m bunch of mean, angry people. <laughs> now, I mean, I, I grew up in those churches, so I know what I'm talking about. You know, they were nice people, but overall, it was all truth, very little grace. Now, the truth talked about grace. They just didn't live grace very well. And so there weren't a whole lot of people, you know, <laughs> coming into the church and meeting Jesus because if people are like, I don't want to hang out with those mean people. So, uh, so Corinth, they had this declared Christian who was openly living this immoral life, and the church was just okay with it. And Paul screams, no! No, no. Look, he says, I'm fine with sexually immoral people and greedy people and swindlers and idolaters and all the rest. He goes, those are the people I want to lead to Jesus. Those are the people I want to see meet Jesus because he'll change their lives. But, um, but you've got a guy right there who says he's a follower of Jesus, but there's no change in his life and he's flaunting his sin. See, Paul goes, if they embrace Jesus, he's going to change their lives. But if you're living a, a committed, unrepentant, openly defiant sin in your life, it's not consistent with following Jesus. And you need to do something about it. Are we uncomfortable yet? See, some of us are like, what are you going to do about it? Some of you are like, oh, 
crap, I'm more like that guy. I need to do something about that. Now, I mean, look, the passage isn't supposed to be comfortable. He's not writing it to, be, to win in a popularity contest. So here's the reality here at Calvary. We're fine with your mess, okay? You're new here. You're a guest here. You're seeking Jesus. We have no expectations of you and your life, okay? If you're a new believer, we know that Jesus is in the process of changing your life. The Holy Spirit is working in you. He, by the way, the Holy Spirit, if he's in you, he will convict you of sin. He will lead you into truth. And while he's doing that, we're gonna love you. We're gonna teach you. We're gonna encourage you to follow Jesus, okay? That's what we're gonna do. We're committed to grace and truth. We're gonna love you and we're gonna tell you the truth. And, but we're gonna let the Holy Spirit apply it to your life and you're going to change for real because we see it happen over and over and over again. So, <coughs> now my voice isn't fine. We're not, we're not expecting perfection. We're expecting progress. Because you can't follow Jesus and stay where you are. You can't follow Jesus and stay the same. And, and if you'll use that in your life to ask yourself hard questions, it'll help tremendously. I'm following Jesus. Do I see progress? Do I see, you know, obedience? Do I feel conviction? Because you can't follow Jesus and stay where you are. So then... Some of you might be wondering, where does the accountability and expectation show up here at Calvary? Here at Calvary, leaders embrace accountability. <clears throat> Your leaders embrace accountability. Uh, now, honestly, there's a few barriers to becoming a member of Calvary. Uh, and we'll talk about those at another time. But real accountability starts at leadership. First and foremost, starts with me. I embrace accountability. I welcome accountability. <clears throat> because I'm a better man when I have accountability. I'm a better follower of Jesus when uh, my life is transparent. By the way, there's a reason that transparent living is one of our core values. We believe that uh, we should be real, open, and honest with God and others, and we should allow them to do the same. To do the same. So I, I face uh, professional and personal accountability, financial, moral accountability. I, I, you know, I face uh, and embrace leadership accountability. But it's not just me, it's also all the pastors on the team. All of our pastors. We embrace accountability. We have peer accountability with each other. Every Monday morning, the senior pastors meet. Every afternoon, all the pastors meet together. Uh, then there's professional accountability with the personnel team and with the executive council. They're the people who can fire us. So if we mess up, there's accountability. And yes, I can be fired. We have accountability for our lives with the deacons. Got a bunch of deacons around here, great servants of God. They're always the ones behind the scenes making stuff work, helping out. We're accountable to them. And then, of course, we're accountable to the whole community. Not just you guys, but Lake Havasu City. Because you can't keep secrets very long in Lake Havasu or Parker, can you? We all know that. If you haven't learned that, that's just a warning. So, it's not just us, though. Our deacons embrace accountability. Our life group leaders embrace accountability. The decision makers, the ministry leaders, all welcome accountability. And that all starts when they take one of our next step classes called LEAD. By the way, if you haven't heard about our next step classes, they're the next step you can take. So August 27th is our next scheduled next step classes. We've got intro, so if you're new to the church or if you've actually just never taken it, you might want to do that tells you how to become a member, tells you what we believe, tells you how we operate. And then there's grow, which will tell you about how to feed yourself spiritually so that you're not dependent on someone else to tell you the truth. And, and then there's serve. Want to know what that's about? Anyway, it's about serving, how we serve, why we serve, the way we do it here at Calvary. And then the last class is lead. 
lead. You hear me talk about that. I always tell you, I lead it, and I want you to come to it. And lead is a deep dive on why we do what we do at Calvary, but it also ends with uh, basically a challenge. Hey, if you want to be a leader here, you have to sign a commitment card. We have a leadership covenant, and in it, it's basically an invitation to accountability, mutual accountability, because you're a leader. Now, we're accountable to you as pastors, but it's about accountability uh, in your moral life, your relational life, your ministry life, your financial life, and your biblical fidelity. And if someone who's in leadership has an issue, crosses the line of conduct or morality or integrity, we have a conversation of grace and truth. Because we'll encourage repentance. We always encourage repentance because that's the grace part. But occasionally, not often, but occasionally, somebody will say, I'm not going to repent, can't repent then we'll ask for them to honor their original commitment, which is to resign. Well, if you can't live up to the, the commitment that you made, we're going to ask you to step down until you repent, until you get your life straight. Um, and now we always hope for repentance, because that's grace, but we, as your leaders, will not compromise truth. We're not going to compromise truth. And yes, in case you're wondering, we have these conversations somewhat regularly, because we've got a lot of leaders here at Calvary. And we're all still sinners. So that's how Calvary navigates grace and truth. It's messy. We feel the tension. But we want to grow in both grace and truth. So let me ask you a question. How are you growing in grace and in truth? How is Jesus changing your life? Do you know how? If you can't see how Jesus is changing your life, maybe you want to talk to a pastor, meet with the prayer team, fill out a connect card and say, hey, someone call me, I got questions. Because we want you to remember, I want this to stick, you can't follow Jesus and stay the same. It's impossible. It's impossible. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us grace and teaching us truth. Thank you for the example of Jesus uh, for the difficult passage in 1 Corinthians that makes us uncomfortable. And Lord, uh, we know it's there because you want us to be people of grace and truth at the same time. So uh, help us to do that as a church, but even more so right now, help us to do that as your followers. God, help us to figure out where we need to apply more grace to our life and our relationships, more truth in our life and our relationships. God, I, I pray that every person here and those joining us online would, would ask the hard question of how is Jesus changing my life? And, and God, they'd open their ears and they would listen to your voice call them to life change so that we can live as sons and daughters of God, representing Jesus to a world that is desperate to find hope and life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As Pastor Chad said, it's impossible to follow Jesus and stay the same. So I challenge you to think about how your life has changed since you've given your life to Him. If you're still unsure how to give your life to Jesus or have questions about what it means to follow Him, I invite you to contact us. You can send us an email to questions at calvaryaz.com and one of our pastors will reach out to you. Well, that'll wrap it up for today. Bye-bye.